बड़ा बड़ा इससे बड़ा क्या होगा इसका भी
Varying these roots means you are varying the poles of the closed loop transformation. Now suppose we want to improve the amplifier gain. Practical example, we want to improve the amplifier gain. Without disturbing actually by improving the gain itself, what you can change, you can change the coefficients of this equation. Rather, you can change the poles of the control system, uh, closed loop transfer function, and then you can improve the amplifier gain of any system. And again, that, is, that if you want to improve the amplifier gain of any of the systems, you want to improve the gain and bring the system in the region of stability, better amplifier gain you should have. Now, amplifier gain basically, if you improve the amplifier gain, what it will performance will improve in terms of the stability. The performance of any system will improve in terms of the stable you can make them. So you don't have to, by using the circuitry itself, you don't have to employ that and increase the gain of this amplifier. Rather you can change the coefficients of this characteristic equation or you can change holes of the closed loop control system. Those holes or those coefficients you can change and then you can improve the performance of the any control system. Now, the characteristic equation in general is given as an open loop cross function we have. See, this is an open loop cross function. And this here, if you want to mention, the second order system control system, closed loop system you can mention. What was this equal to? Omega n square. S square 2 xi omega ns plus omega n square. So, this is the characteristic equation of the second order control system. By changing the coefficients, you can change the performance because different types of responses you will be able to obtain. What are the transient responses? We have say under damp, over damp, critically damp, undamped, all those responses you will be able to get. And by varying these roots only, or holes, you can improve the stability of the control system. Now, second is, let's say this is a characteristic equation. Characteristic equation of a second order control system is given by this. Now, if you have a negative, particularly for the negative feedback control system, this is G of S. This is the feedback H of S. This characteristic equation, and I present the open loop transfer function which will include the variable gain k, which will include the variable gain k. Let me express that in the factorized form. The open loop transfer function, which will use the variable gain k, and then I can represent the factorized form of this. What is this? I am representing an open loop transfer function which is g of s of h of s having that's having a variable being k and that I will holds and zeros I am representing the factorized form as like this. So this equation let, let me call this equation as the equation number one. Now this equation if I have to write this equation will be equal to g of s h of s above I can write this let's say this is one is 2 and equation 1 I can represent as minus 1 I can write it minus 1 plus j0 this minus 1 plus j0 can also be written as 1 at an angle of 2 q plus 1 1 at an angle of 2 q plus 1 into 180 divided by p minus 7 I can represent this as Minus 
minus 1 plus 0 how are we going to represent? This I am going to represent by 1 at a magnitude of at a sorry magnitude will be 1 so then angle will be 2 q plus 1 at an angle of multiplied by 180 see you can see if you put this 0 this will come to be 180 fine this is 180 if you put it 1 if you put it 1 so this is 3 3 into 180 you will get thrice uh, rotation we will see this way problem <coughs> we use this equation when we are drawing the root load this, this is for the root load minus 1 can be represented as minus 1 plus 0 in the in the S plane and then if I have represented this minus 1 I can represent this in angle in polar form as 1 at an angle of 2 2 plus 1 multiplied by 1 into where 2 value will vary from 0 to infinite so this is now key point is here key point is what now if we are talking about the root locus any value of s if we have different values of s if that satisfies this equation this equation any value of s if that satisfies this equation that's called equation number second then that point will be called as the root of the characteristic equation that will be called as the root of the characteristic equation so that will form the basis of the root locus representation. So any value of S that satisfies this equation will form the basis of the root locus method. Now what you now basically root locus is, if we conclude what the root locus is, root locus is basically the representation of roots of the characteristic equation in S plane like this. We have S plane like this where we have a real axis. Imaginary axis. So root, root locus basically is representation of roots of the characteristic equation in this plane or the poles of the closed loop transfer function in this plane. Now root with while we have we have drawn the root locus diagram, it will be very easy for us with the naked eye, we can easily ascertain the stability of a control system in a sense. That if the roots will lie here, will be marginally stable on the geomega axis. If roots will be to the graph will be completely to the right of the plane, it will be unstable system. And if it will, it will be towards the left of the plane, it will be stable system. So we will represent them, and then only we can say which of the system is stable or not. This is a very, very important matter as far as the gate or any examination is concerned. At least one question is asked, one at least, I think at least one. So I hope this is clear. You can write the definition. Root locus is a graphical method to find the position of the roots of the characteristic equation. It's a gra graphical method to find the position of the roots of the characteristic equation or the poles of the closed loop transform. Find the position of the roots of the characteristic equation or the poles of a closed loop transfer function. So, this is definition you can write. So, what is the basic you can write? The process of finding points on the S plane, with, with this you can include this sentence also. The process of finding points on the S plane. Which satisfies the above condition. Which condition? This condition. Above means this condition I am talking about. Above or below you are talking about what it is. Okay, which satisfies this condition. That means g of s, h of s is minus 1. That is equal to 1. At an angle of 2, 2 plus 1 into 180 per q will vary from 0, 1 to so on and so forth. Is the basis of the root locus matter. So this is the basis of the root locus matter. The next question is. Now, how to sketch this root locus? So, next is next is steps for sketching or plotting root locus. So, this was introduction about the root locus. One by one point you have to understand, and then in a conventional examination, you have to draw it by writing the steps. 
So in data examination, you should know few points, you should mark that. Correct answer. So both the, both the examinations are very important. In middle school examination, you have completed right. Like engineering, engineering service examination, they will ask the root of the sun, so you have to draw it or sketch it. In the data examination, they will give you a figure. They will tell you what is the transfer function, or they will tell you this is the transfer function, what is the figure, or there can be some other questions also. So, next is steps for sketching. Those will be the holes, and from those two, you have to find the holes and zeros. So, 
That's a step number one. Step number two. What is step number two? Step number two means that root locus will have as well. what is the basically what is the loci? Will be moving because once, once will be uh, once we we'll proceed further in the coming time we'll see that the loops loop loops will start at certain position from a pole where the constant value will be zero and then it will terminate at what and the constant value will be infinity so there will be definitely path for the branch that's the called a branch so next point is we are talking about the branches. The root locus will have as many loci or branches. Okay, that will depend on the order of the characters. So, the root locus will have as many loci or branches. So, what is the branch here? See, root locus. Whenever we are talking about the branch, I will clear this in the coming steps. Also, this will be clear. Branch means if I am drawing a root locus. Root locus has to start from somewhere. So, what is the basis of the root locus to start? It will start with a constant zero and it will start from a pole. Branch, where the constant value or the gain value or whatever you are designing in a control system, that value will be zero, but you have to start it from the pole. Then, what will happen? This will terminate at a zero if zero is present in the transfer function, open loop transfer function. It will terminate at a zero with a gain with k equal to infinity. This is zero, this is pole. So starting from pole and terminating at zero. Now sometimes what can happen? There can be more number of poles and there can be lesser number of zeros. That can also happen. But then you have to terminate a branch. Suppose there are two poles and one zero. For one, you don't have a problem. It will start from a pole with a gain of k equal to 0 and it will terminate at k equal to infinity at a 0. Then second, there will be another pole but there will be no 0. So then we have to terminate it at a virtual 0. We call it virtual 0. There will be no 0 but it has to terminate. Path has to be there. Whether the 0 is present or not, we have to make a virtual 0 and we have to form a path for this. That's called a branch. Locus is path. Okay, and this is a complete branch. Now, why I'm talking about here, I'm talking that loci or branches in case of root locus will depend upon the order of the characteristic equation. It will depend on the order of the characteristic equation. What is the order of the characteristic equation? In general, in general, if I have to say, in general, the number of branches, okay. In general, if I have to say a general statement, in general, root locus equals. No, in general, we can write down. In general, number of branches of the root locus. In general, number of branches of root locus equals to p or z. Whichever is greater. So, in general, what will happen? The number of branches which will exist in the root locus will depend on P or Z, whichever is greater. So, what are the cases? Three cases can arise. Number one, if P is greater than zero, then number of branches or loci will be equal to P. Second case, if z is greater than p, number of branches will be equal to z. Third case, if p is equal to z, the number of branches will be equal to p will be equal to z. So this is the case we are following. Three cases can arise, maximum of three cases can arise in the root locus, the number of branches. Number of branches will depend on what? It will depend on p or z. Both of them, which are, which are, whichever is the greater, it will depend, but if they are equal, then it will equal to both. I hope this is clear. What's the branch? What's the wire from it will start? And wire from it will terminate. 
Number second, this is for the second step. I think I did, I did not draw, I draw a plot here, but I always remember number of branches will be equal to P or Z, whichever is there. So, step number third. Step number third is saying what I have explained earlier. Step number third is that the root locus will start, the branch of the root locus will start from a pole with a gain k equal to 0 and it will terminate at a 0 with gain k equal to infinity. So you can write down this. The branches of the root locus starts, starts at poles of g of s, h of s, that's open cross function. Start at poles of G of S, H of S with k equal to 0 H of S with k equal to 0 and they will terminate at a 0 with k equal to infinity they will terminate at 0 with k equal to infinity. Now, generally we will see in any type of transfer function or whole transfer function, you can see the number of poles will be always greater than, it's a general rule. General criterion, the number of poles will be greater than the number of zeros. So, in that case, I already told you what we have to do. We have to start a branch, a branch should always start from a pole, it should terminate at 0. If there are, there is a second pole but there is no 0, then the branch again will start from the pole and pole of what? The open cross function and it will terminate at the virtual z. Okay, this was a no, let, let us have some explanation of this. What the reasoning of this? Let me have a characteristic equation. The reason is this was follows. Let's say g of s h of s is equal to, I have taken 1 equal to. Zero. That's quite clear. I hope this is clear. Both the cases k equal to infinity. 
So you have to draw from the path like this. It has to start from where? It has to start from. It has to start from a goal with a gain minimum. It has to terminate at a zero with a gain maximum. And this you can by this explanation you can easily, easily say that that once we have k equal to zero, so it will start from the poles of an open cross function. If this is infinite, so it will terminate at zero. So this is the explanation behind this. Okay, this is the one to write. Okay. So then I have explained already if there will be no zero, then the virtual zero will be considered because branch has to be completed. Branch has to start from where? Well, from a pole with a equal to zero and it has to terminate. Whether it's a physical zero or whether it's a virtual zero, it has to terminate. Next. So when we draw the root locus, whenever we are drawing the root locus, root locus will be symmetrical to the real axis. Symmetrical means what? Whatever we will see the image on the top of the real axis, the same image will be at the bottom of the real axis also. So next point is very simple. You can write down root locus either moves along the real axis or root locus either moves along the real axis or the complex loops must occur in quantity pairs. What is the step? Step number four. So what is this? Root locus either moves along the real axis or the complex poles must occur in the conjugate pairs. Therefore, root locus is symmetrical about real axis. Therefore, root locus is is symmetrical about What is the meaning of this one? See, if you have a root locus like this, this is your real axis represented by sigma, this is your imaginary axis represented by j omega minus j omega, and this is negative. So, this is the real axis. If I am drawing the root locus like this, till now you don't know how to draw it. Let me explain. This is the way we can get root locus. One, so you can very clearly see. Here, what are the values you can cut on the imaginary axis? There is a marginal value. That's the marginal stability. We know that uh, what are the values will be there. That's the marginal stability here. So this exactly will be the mirror image of this one. So that's what we are calling. The whenever we draw a root locus, the root locus you can, can move along the real axis. We don't have any problem. You can move along the complex plane. This is a complex plane. You can see where j values will be coming. So there are some where j values will be coming. Here the real values will be coming. So this is a complex plane as plane. So it can go along the real axis or whenever the roots of the complex number have to exist, they have to exist in a conjugate pairs. And then when you are drawing or sketching a root locus, that will be exactly symmetrical to the that will be symmetrical to the real axis. That means it will be a mirror image on the top and the bottom. That is the meaning of the root locus will be symmetrical about the real axis. So next is this is the step number four, next is step number five. So step number five is now how to determine that a real axis or a real axis whether any portion of the real axis is a part of the root locus or not. Whether the portion of the real, real axis is a part of root locus or not. Okay? We say this is a part of root locus and this is not a part of root locus on the real axis. So how we can ascertain it? How we can say it? So step number five. See, before explanation, you can write one point. Okay, you can write down a point. Any point on the real axis, any point on the real axis, or the value of s, point means in the value because we are living in the roots of 
passive. We are dealing with the because we are with the complex plane passive. Any point or sorry, any value of the S, okay, the value of the S on the real axis will be a part of root locus, will be a part of root locus if the total number of poles plus zeros. If the total number of poles plus sorry, poles plus zeros, if the total number of poles plus zeros to the right of that point is odd, to the right of that point is odd. Otherwise, if the summation of if the sum of poles plus zero is even, then it will not be a part of root locus. I will explain again. The value of S of any point S on the real axis, the value of S on the real axis is a basically a point. So that will be considered as a part of root locus if and only if, when the summation of poles plus zeros to the right of that is odd, that will be a part of root locus. If the summation of the poles plus zeros to the right of that is even, then that will not be considered as a part of root locus. Let's have an example. I'll take one example. From this example, I'm going to explain. Okay, I'll draw it here. It's pretty simple. It's very important for breakaway and breaking points because once you are considering the centroid breakaway and breaking points, the breakaway points is validated only if it's a part of root locus. Otherwise, it will not be a part of root locus. That will be coming after this. Now see, this is your S plane. This is J omega. This is the imaginary axis, and this is your real axis. Now let us say I have pole here, pole here, zero here, pole here. Okay. Now let me take some arbitrary points. Let me take some. Arbitrary points. Let me take this is S one. Let's say this is S two. Let's say this is S three. Let's say this is S four. So what I have, I have considered an S plane. In an S plane, I have for any open loop transfer function. I have sketched or I have drawn the poles and zeros. What are the position it is? I have not bothered bothered about the position right now. Minus is zero. It's a origin. It's a minus one, minus two. Blah blah blah. I am not worried about that this time. Now, if I have to say whether S one point is a part of a root locus or not, then I have to assign it. Now, on the right side of this, right side of this is only one pole. So one is an odd number. So clearly. This portion, this portion, up to here, up to here, it's a root locus. So this is a part of a root locus. Why? Because to the right of this, up to from, we are not considering the position of this pole. To the right of this pole, any point you consider, and if you see any location after this pole. Can see the summation of poles plus zero zeros. We don't have any side on this side. We don't have any zero. We have only pole. That's an odd number. So when it's an odd number, so this portion very clearly is a part of root locus. Now this was about S one. Now let's say S two now. Now S two we can see this is a point S two to the right of this summation of zeros. There is no zero. Poles are two, so summation is odd. Sorry, even one plus one is two. That's an even number. So this portion, when I am considering this portion, up to this zero, right up to this zero, this is not a part of root locus. So this is not very clearly not a part of root locus. Now, if I consider the point S three, I can see very clearly from the S three. To the right of S three, summation of poles poles are two. Zeros is one. It's an odd number. So that clearly says that this is a part of 
or root locus right from there. For point S, in reference to, in context to the point S3, this is a part of root locus. In context to the S3. Next. Now, if I am talking about the S4, you can very clearly see to the right of S4, to the right of S4, we have two pole, three poles, and a one zero, three plus one is four, which is an odd number. So this portion in context to S4 is not a part of root locus. So this is the way to determine whether any portion from any point is a part of root locus or not. You have to only see the summation of poles plus zeros to the right of that. If that is an odd number, then it's a part of root locus. If it is an even number, then it's not a part of root locus. I clear. So this clarifies this point. Next point is breakaway point. Very important. Step number six. Now break. There are two points called breakaway and breaking points. Okay. Breakaway points. If we are talking about at which the branches of the root locus leaves the rail axis. I will talk about this in detail. There are two points, breakaway point So what is a breakaway point basically? You have to understand it first, it's very easy Breakaway points is the point at which the root locus will leave the rail axis Root locus will, it will leave the rail axis So we have a root locus, it will leave the rail axis and whenever, wherever the, the branches of the root locus will intersect and at this point what will happen? The branches of the root locus are going to intersect. This is a breakaway point. So, it's the point where the root locus leaves the rear axis. Number one. And at this point, the branches of, or it's a point of intersection of the branches of, branches of root locus intersect at this point. At this point, what is also going to happen? This is a point of maximum gain. This is a point of maximum gain also will occur at this point and this alveol will exist between the two adjacent poles so breakaway point always exists between two adjacent adjacent poles and that should be a valid portion, that should be a valid root locus part. That valid that will be validated by this, this point, which I have only taken. I am again repeating. Root locus, what will happen? Breakaway point will always exist between the two adjacent points. That's not enough for a breakaway point to qualify. A particular point cannot qualify to be cannot be qualified to be a breakaway point. Why? If it is between two adjacent points. With this, if it exists between the two adjacent points, then that portion where it will exist, that point should be a valid part of the root locus. And that will be authenticated by the previous step, what I have already taken. That means number of poles plus zeros to the right of that breakaway point has to be odd. Then only it can qualify to be a breakaway point. Okay? So that, that will only qualify. And maximum gain will occur at this, this uh, point. And the branches of the root locus will also intersect it. And then root locus will leave the rail axis. Where will it intersect? It will intersect like this and then it will leave the rail axis. Like this, we will have a, suppose this is a breakaway point. This will intersect here and then this branch will leave here after k equal to infinity. Maybe some is there, and that is k equal to zero to start, and 
the branch will start from here like this with these arrows straight and another will go to the bottom part and there is another that will move from here and that will go to this okay for the infinity maybe zero is present or zero is not present if it's not present then you have to draw the virtual zero so you can very clearly see it will leave the real axis it will leave the real axis and then the point where the where the these are the point is which point where the these two they, where the root locus will intersect at this point the root locus is going to root locus is going to intersect the branches like this the top of the branch on the, this branch will come here and that will intersect here and then will be the real axis now if you are talking about the breaking point in contrary to this breaking point breaking point is what at the breaking point the root locus returns to the real axis root locus returns to the real axis so that is coming back towards the real axis and we will have a minimum gain at this and for the condition to satisfy it breakaway point will break in sorry breaking point will always exist between two adjacent zeros breaking point will always exist between two adjacent zeros only if that breakaway breaking point sorry is a valid root locus part so that Point should be a valid part portion of the root locus. The root locus should exist there. Then only the that point will qualify to be a breaking point. It will exist between two adjacent zeros only if and if if that portion, if that position of the point of the breaking point is a valid portion of the root locus. So this was something about the root locus. Sorry, this was something about the breaking point. Then. How we have to? What is the condition that we have to determine? Breaking points and breakaway points. How we have to calculate them? Now, how we have to calculate them? In the same step, step number six, I think. Now we will be having a characteristic equation in terms of a constant. First job is to differentiate that constant with respect to the independent variable and substitute it equal to zero. How will we calculate the break-in and break-out point? We get a characteristic equation. We will see the constant. We will have that constant in terms of the variable that will be independent. This is a constant depending on some independent variables in terms of s. Then differentiate that constant with respect to that independent variable and substitute it equal to zero. Now what you are going to get? You are going to get the roots. Definitely, if you are substituting it equal to zero. You are going to get some roots. Now, breaking or breakaway points should be definitely the roots of this equation. So, breakaway and breaking points should be roots of equation one. But at the same time, all the roots cannot be breakaway breaking points. All the roots of this equation cannot be breakaway. This is also. This should be very clear. Why? What's the reason? Rule number nine. Why not all the roots be breakaway breaking points in this case? They, 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 should, they should be a valid part of the root locus. They should be a valid part. Maybe some are, some are not. So whichever there are, they will be valid breakaway points. They will qualify to be a breakaway point or breaking point. But if they are not. But there are definitely maybe there will be four roots of this equation. Let's say, or let's say there will be three roots of this equation. But roots can be three. But out of the three roots, only one will qualify to be a breakaway point. Other will not qualify to be. It. How it has to qualify? First of all, it has to be between two adjacent zeros. So adjacent poles. Number one condition to satisfy it. Number two, that should be a part of the root locus. So that means the to the right of that point. The sum of both more zeros has to be odd. Then, so sum may be the roots of this equation, 
they can be even between they, there can be breaking point even between two adjacent zeros but maybe at that breaking point the sum of or sum of poles plus zeros to the right of that may not be or that will be given that this qualifies to be a part of that this qualifies to be a breaking point so this is a valid point which we have to consider now if uh, roots are complex then also they will qualify there is a condition for it k has to be positive and that function will get separated. Okay. Now let me have an example of this one. Let us consider an open loop transfer function. I have a few of them. Let's consider an example. Negative feedback control system having example negative feedback control system. Okay. Then. That uh, system is having a system, control system with open loop transfer. So what is that? That should be G of S, H of S. It should be G of S, H of S. And what should be that G of S, H of S? I have taken K S plus one, S plus two. Imaginary 
x-axis, this is your real axis, and this we call S plane, complex S plane. This is origin where we have zeros at minus one. So we have zero at minus one, then we have zero at minus two. Minus two we have zero. Then we have poles at poles at origin. So we have pole at origin. We have pole at one. Okay, s equal to minus one. You can see, put it s plus one equal to zero. S is minus one and minus two. These are zeros. Poles at origin and this is s equal to plus one. Okay. Now what is the point we are getting? We are getting point three six six plus in this. So this will be somewhere here. Point three one third of this. Up to one, so this is point three six six. We locate both of them. S two is minus one point three six six. So this will be up to here. Here the second point will be minus one point three six six. Now number one we will check S one. Check the S1 now. Let's say this is point S1. This is your first root S1. This is your second S2. Okay. So your root locus will be something like this. But let us validate whether it's a break point. Now it is existing between the two adjacent poles. Fine. Second, it should be a part of root locus, and this, this is basically a root of this equation. Is it? This? Is a root number one condition it is satisfying that this is a root of this equation d k by d k is equal to zero. Number two, this is existing between the two adjacent poles. Yes. Number three, whether it's a part of root locus. Yes, because right side to it, the summation of poles is plus zeros is one because there is no zero. So definitely this is a breakaway point. There is no problem in this. This is a breakaway point. All the three conditions it satisfies. It's a root of this d k by d s equal to zero number one. Number two, it exists between the two adjacent poles. Number three, it's a portion of the root locus. Why? Because the summation of this poles plus zeros to the right of this is odd number, and that is definitely odd. So it's a breakaway point. Now this is a part of this equation. Fine, there's no problem. This is one of the root of this equation. Number two, it exists between two x. Two adjacent zeros, yeah, it is existing between two adjacent zeros. Third, whether it's a part of a root locus, you can see summation of poles. Poles are two, zeros is one. Yeah, summation of poles to the right of this poles plus zeros to the right of this is also odd number. So this is again a valid breaking point. So how will be the root locus now? I am not drawing root locus. You should not be worried about this. What I am doing. This is the sketch we will get. That we'll see later. So if I have to start, that branch will start at k equal to zero, like this. Okay. And that will terminate at k equal to infinity on the. Let me write a little bit. Examinations, gate examinations. You have to see the diagram. अभी मैंने दो तीन चीजें नहीं पढ़ाई हैं. You have to see the diagram and get answers. इसका पता होना चाहिए कि कैसे आंसर करना है. In gate exams, normal exam में तो ये बनाना बहुत बड़ा. See, what was the, what are the, we have minus one. This minus one here. And this is. Minus two, so this is a physical zero here and a physical zero here. Then what I have? I have pole at origin zero, and then I have pole at one. Oh, fine. So this is your real axis. This is your imaginary axis. And this is your complex axis. 
Okay. So where is the location of the point three six? It will be somewhere here. So this point is point three six six plus, and the point is here minus one point three six six. So this is your breakaway point. This is your breaking point that I already explained. Now, how the sketch of root locus will be? It will be like this. Okay, this will come. You don't have to worry. We will we'll talk about this so for the time being. I am showing the directions of branches. Now, branch first will start. Okay, it will start from a pole k equal to zero. Then. Okay. It has to terminate at where? It has to terminate at zero with a gain of k equal to infinity. So this is a number one branch. Very clearly you can see. It starts on a pole. This is the path it is following. It is terminating at a zero. K equal to zero. How many branches will be there? Number of four. Two. Two. Because it depends on number of poles or zero. P equal to z is equal to two in this case. You know, poles be two and zeros be two. Four be four. Branches will be two one. That can there can be more than more than branches. Okay. Now another will start from there. This K equal to zero, which is at location plus one. Something. Yeah. Plus one. What was this? Plus pole comb type. One. One plus one. This plus one. Then to start from k equal to zero, you can see. Okay. Where it has to go? It has to go to the another. To start from the pole with a k equal to zero. Having said this, now what happens at the break breakaway point? You can see this is this at this point the root locus will intersect. That's what I have told you very clearly. It's intersecting at this point, and then what's happening at this breakaway point? It moves away from the rail axis. Okay, it is moving from it is intersecting at this point, and then it's moving away from the rail axis. That was very clear. Similarly, here also it is intersecting at this point. And moving away from the real axis. In contrary to this, you can see here it is. In this case, this is returning to the real axis. Here you can see this is returning. To the, this is not moving away from the real axis. Breaking point. So these two points are very clear. Okay, now I am clear. 